The windows of Ukraine still can't believe what they're witnessing. Sound follows light. And chaos follows both. This was the university building in Kharki. The target may have been the police headquarters next door. The Russians pride themselves on their precision bombing. So how is that working out? Moscow says it is liberating Ukraine from a government of neo-Nazis and drug addicts. To the liberators, piles of rubble and the fear of the innocent. Oh, it's close. Alex is a video producer in Kharkiv. It's 2nd of March. Everything is fine, his wife Orla tells their daughter Kira. 17 p.m. Hello. Uh, we are packing, uh, but it's not fine. And they're now packing up to leave. With no idea when they can return or to what. Those that don't leave try to make sure the Russians don't get to arrive. This is the road to Enehoda, site of Europe's biggest nuclear power plant. With this roadblock, the locals want to make sure the Russian troops don't get anywhere close. But the sandbags and the resilience are not much protection against Russian grenades and machine guns. And so to the purveyors of that Russian world. The Kremlin has started showing off its hardware again, in slick videos, this time heading to real battle. What matches Ukraine's army against this, let alone its civilians? But Russia has now admitted that it has lost almost 500 soldiers, a rare admission, and killed 2,800 Ukrainian troops and what they call nationalists. None of these numbers can be verified on either side. This was a Russian tank parked in Kherson on the Black Sea. They are beginning to arrive. They are telling people to stay inside, uh, shooting in the air. You hear the sounds. But in the city's Freedom Square, the locals were thumbing their nose at the occupiers. Shame and worse, they shouted the Russian soldiers with their hands in the air, clutching grenades. In Konotop, they've just been to see the mayor to deliver an ultimatum. Surrender or we will flatten your city with artillery, they told him. <laughs> the mayor, who belongs to an extreme right-wing party, poses the question to his people, fight or surrender. <laughs> fight is the answer. You may abhor the mayor's politics, but you cannot doubt their resilience. They may get occupied, but it's hard to imagine them being Moscow's willing subjects. This was Zhetomir, where a Russian missile was meant for a military target, but ended up destroying residential buildings, killing four, including a child. More ceasefire talks are due to be held tomorrow, but what's the point when Ukrainians are preparing for another night like this? Well, earlier I spoke to Igor Zhokva, the deputy head of the office of the president of Ukraine and head of foreign policy. And I began by asking him how President Zelensky was bearing up. Uh, president is a very high spirit. Uh, please uh, don't uh, listen to any rumors or whatever. No panic among the population of Ukraine. Yes, we are fighting the war now, but at the same time we are thinking about how to prevent this uh, disaster happening. That's why my president was absolutely very clear uh, yesterday in the European Parliament, Ukraine needs accession to the European Union. The day before yesterday, he summoned the application for the membership of the European Union. And now we're working hard with the members of the European Union to speed up the procedure of Ukraine joining to the EU. This would be one of the best guarantees for Ukrainian European future. So he got a standing ovation in the European Parliament. Yesterday, half the members of that parliament were wearing uh, blue and yellow, like much of the world. But they've said that this process of accession to the EU will take time. Is that enough for you? Normal... Do you need to hear something a bit more urgent? 
well really in a normal uh, uh, situation it might have taken years and years what we now asking from the european union you have to make an unprecedented move uh, towards ukraine all ordinary ukrainians are paying their lives for not only ukraine but the european future that's why let's forget about bureaucracy let's forget about this uh, routine which we always have in the european union let's be very quick let move ukraine into the eu my president said very quickly don't let us alone Please do understand that we are Europeans as well, and we deserve to be a member of the European Union already now. What's your reaction to the fact that Russian forces, as we speak, are trying to flatten many of your cities, hitting civilian targets, killing dozens of people, many of them innocent civilians? What's your reaction to that? That's absolutely awful. That's a barbaric act of the country uh, in the uh, 21st century. But let me tell you very openly, they are doing it already for the seventh day. They thought about Blitzkrieg, and they really failed with this Blitzkrieg on the first days. They wanted to encircle Kyiv, they wanted to encircle Kharkiv, they wanted to encircle other uh, big cities and uh, small towns in Ukraine. For the time being, we are fighting severely. At the beginning, they, they were saying that they're hitting only mi military infrastructure. Look what is happening. Look what happened yesterday in Kharkiv. Look what happened yesterday in Kyiv. Unfortunately, they are not observing any humanitarian rules, any humanitarian rules of war. That's what the world is witnessing. That's what Ukraine is suffering. What NATO could do now for Ukraine is to close the sky of Ukraine, to protect the sky, or at least partially the parts of the Ukrainian sky uh, against uh, the uh, Russian aviation. That is not, you know, uh, fighting the, 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 con uh, the, the conflict with Russia, but that would really help. That's what Ukraine needs. We are talking with uh, foreign leaders to have this opportunity for Ukraine, but unfortunately this is not happening. So my plea to the uh, member states, help Ukraine in this component. The rest we will do by ourselves. But that has been more or less ruled out, hasn't it, enforcing a no-fly zone, because it would lead to a clash between the Russian Air Force and the NATO Air Force. We are asking for the uh, every possible uh, support, be it a lethal weapon or be it a defensive weapon. So we need everything. Uh, again, uh, we need the equipment, we need the weapons. The rest will be done with the armed forces of Ukraine who are showing their strength, who are showing their willing to uh, overcome the aggressor. Where do you think all this will end and how long will it take? We would like to lead it to the uh, settlement. Definitely people are dying every day. Again, you know, you have, you, Ukraine is ready for negotiations. That You know that the first round of negotiations was already taking place. There is a high possibility that today the negotiations will be continued. But again, um, the prerequisite for these negotiations from Ukrainian side is the ceasefire, complete ceasefire in all the parts of Ukraine and withdrawal of Russian uh, troops completely from the country. So they've got to stop fighting before they can any be, be any point to these talks, really? Absolutely. And finally, Igor, when did you last see your family? So my family uh, three days ago, they are safe and sound and everything is going well with them. Mm. And when did you last see your president? <laughs> I'm in constant uh, call, uh, I'm in constant uh, negotiations and communication with him. Okay, we wish you all the best. Igor Jokra, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Well, in Russia, the jailed opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, has called on people to take to the streets to protest against the war with Ukraine, telling them that Putin is not Russia. Well, earlier I spoke to former Russian MP and diplomat Natalia Narochnitskaya. I asked her how appalled she was by what she was witnessing in Ukraine right now. Huh. I'm much more uh, surprised how the West could totally ignore the killing murder of Russian people in Donetsk that was going on in eight years. I know uh, no matter what I say, you will be on the side of Ukrainians uh, saying that Russians are murderers, etc. But the, because the information picture on your TV is totally different from the information picture on our TV. That's why it's a conversation that, between That may people. very well be the case, Natalia. Maybe, maybe you're not seeing the full picture in Russia. But as a, as a mother, perhaps a grandmother, I just ask you, do you have any sympathy when six-year-old girls are killed by shells? Oh, I do have great sympathy because I'm a mother and I'm a grandmother. And of course, I take the whole situation as a drama. Do you know how much suppressed were Russian people in Donetsk? 
because their only fault mm. was that they wanted to stay what they are, to continue to mm. identify themselves in Russian okay. language, continue right. that they were forbidden Natalia. that, and they declared autonomy, Natalia. and that's why they started Natalia. being let's not, let's not talk about. Let's not talk about Donetsk. I just let me ask you this very simply: um, Are there Ukrainian tanks? in Moscow right now, or St. Petersburg, shelling Russian civilians? Yes or no? No, in Moscow, no. No, no but in is Donetsk, the answer. Yeah. But no, in, the, exactly. in Donetsk, yes. But there in are Donetsk, Russian, yes. but there are, forget Donetsk for a minute, but there are Russian tanks how, how can I shelling forget? Ukrainian civilians in Kyiv. You keep talking about the past. Let's talk about the present, Kyiv. the here and now. There is an army of 190,000 soldiers and hundreds of tanks and artillery and helicopter gunships and cruise missiles and the whole box of military tricks descending on a country that I'm afraid to say does not want you here. Whether you like it or not, they don't want to be liberated or denazified or whatever you want to call it by your soldiers. Ah, uh, my dear counterpart. You chose to say that you agree with the desire for some people or authorities of these people to stay Nazis. I wonder what you think will this lead to? What's, what's the end game here? Because even if you flatten this country and you occupy it, you're not going to have people welcome you with flowers. So how does this end, Natalia? This is the federalization of Ukraine, which was the only possible way at the beginning of their state independence uh, to have the state stable, neutral, uh, you know, milking two cows, Russia and the West, but the West didn't want such a Ukraine at all. And if you think that if we didn't do what we now started, and there is no goal to occupy Ukraine, there is a goal of nazification, denazification, like it was with Germany. But you probably want that new war has started. Ukraine is becoming the trigger for the new uh, Third World War. And we do not want that. And especially you. you well, you then why did you send. Why, in any way why or did your another, president you send the army in? If the West didn't, didn't sponsor the. Mod, the current philosophy and ideology of Ukraine, <coughs> if NATO was not approaching our borders, if the West answered our legitimate concerns with regard to our security, there wouldn't have been such a situation now. But what you're doing, what your army is doing to these people here is destroying their cities, killing their children, Killing the innocent civilians. That is a real. That yes, is a real thing. That empty. is a real thing that is happening, and I just wonder where you see this all ending because you're going to have an Afghanistan on your doorstep, and we know what happened with the Soviet army in Afghanistan. You eventually had to leave, and that was the end of the so-called Soviet Empire. So how does this end? This will end the same happy end as with Nazi Germany. And we will withdraw, certainly, from Ukraine after uh, this noble and uh, honest goal is, uh, you know, realized, etc. My final question to you, Natalia, is how does it feel? How does it feel to be the citizen of a pariah state? Uh, I think I can uh, address the same question for you, my dear, the country who supports any terrorists in uh, Chechnya, terrorists in uh, Kosovo, and even recognizing this terrorist, uh, you know, uh, center in Europe. Russian uh, army doesn't commit atrocities. Of course, it is shelling, and some people died. But war is war, of course, and it is a drama. And for me, it's also a drama because uh, the graves of my uh, grandfather uh, lie in the Chernigov region in Ukraine. I tell you, finally, that... it may be a drama for you sitting in your study in Moscow. It's a lot more than a drama for the people getting killed on the ground in Ukraine. But I'm going to leave it you there. Know, you Natalia know, I'm old, I'm thank you very much I'm indeed. Even... This interview is now over. It is now I, over. I, Thank you.
Now, the number of people who have fled Ukraine has passed 800,000, according to the United Nations, just, just in one week. Our international editor Lindsay Hilsom met some of those fleeing the violence by road across the country. Lindsay and her team started the day in the central Ukrainian city of Uman and then drove to the border town of Mohilib Podilitsky, from where she joins us now. Lindsay. Matt, as you can see, I'm in front of the police station in this border town with Moldova, and you can see all the sandbags up at the entrance. So these people here are very prepared for what may happen next. We met a lot of different people coming down the road from all over Ukraine. But one of the things which I found most interesting is that not everybody I met was fleeing. I met some who had come back to fight, and others who are determined to stay. A stall at the side of the road to Moldova, not selling local delicacies, but providing food for those fleeing towns across Ukraine. One woman with a tiny baby had fled Kharkiv. What was the situation like there? Very awful. Our house was destroyed. Our documents were loosed. Many people was died. But they're also fleeing places which are not yet under major attack, trying to get ahead. People like 16-year-old Maria and her family from Kropivinsky. Last night there were a lot of sirens that are going on. Uh, there were probably drones that were flying around. We don't know exactly what's happening. Uh, airplanes probably were also flying around. Um, we, our airplanes were trying to uh, find the Russian attackers, and uh, it was just like a game of mi mice and uh, cats. Cat and mice, yeah. yeah, you seem very calm. <laughs> yeah, I'm already used to it. At the beginning, I ha I was very scared. I had like panic attacks because I saw the airplanes. Uh, I was just I didn't know whether it was the Russian ones or ours. Uh, I I cried a lot of the times, but now I'm way, way calmer because I'm already used to it. I it's only it was really sad that people get used to this. Leaving is hard, but some have travelled in the other direction. Some 80,000 Ukrainians have returned since the Russian attack. Many of them men like Vitali, who was working on a construction site in Poland and has come home to fight. I came here because my motherland is in trouble. My child, my family and my land are here, so I had to come to protect all of this. We saw hundreds of cars heading for the border, where we found Maria, who isn't crossing, but returning to Kyiv to help others prepare for the journey. When you look at the border here, do you feel any temptation to cross yourself? Uh, no, but uh, you know, it's a rather strange feeling to understand that there it's absolutely safe, but. Uh, I don't want to go there. I know that it would be good and safe and nice, but I really feel that I need to be there. You need to be in Kiev. Yep. Why? Uh, it's my city, it's my country, and we need to have possibility to be all together, to support each other and to show that we are not afraid. We came across a group of foreign students who were leaving, saying a last goodbye. But some Ukrainians See, now is their moment to stay right here. What's really struck me today, Matt, is the differing kinds of resistance. There's the black humour. You mentioned Konotop. There was a video came out of there today with young men approaching the Russian tanks. And they said, you know, half the women in Konotop are witches. I'm told that's a literary reference. Anyway, they said, if you stay here, you'll all become impotent. They didn't put it quite as delicately as that. But there you are. That's a form of strange, surreal resistance, very typical of Ukrainian humour. And on the other hand, we got a message today from a British former soldier called Sean Pinner, who is fighting with the Ukrainian army around Mariupol. He said, this may be the last message you get from me for a long time. He said the grad and artillery fire is relentless. He said that the Russian planes are overhead all the time. He said the afterburners leave a trail. He said, it's like Christmas lights, but with the deathly sound afterwards, the fatal sound of death. We understand that Mariupol is now completely surrounded. No water, no power. The people in there suffering. I thought we'd meet refugees from there today, but I don't think that they can get out. So that is the reality of an asymmetric war where you have black humour versus overwhelming firepower. 
Lindsay, thanks very much indeed. Take care. As well as you can hear yet again tonight, the sirens around Lviv, the air raid sirens are going off. We have this almost every night. There has been no attack on the city so far. And yet, at the same time, this sound, which gets you right here in the pit of your stomach, doesn't leave much uh, of a sense of humor, I have to say. Anyway, in a rare show of unity in Washington last night, President Biden led members of Congress from all parties in a standing ovation in tribute to the people of Ukraine during his first State of the Union address. And support for Ukraine was also in evidence at the United Nations General Assembly, which has, within the last couple of hours, voted to condemn Russia's invasion and called on it to pull its forces out of Ukraine immediately. Our correspondent, Siobhan Kennedy, is in Washington now. Siobhan. That's right, Matt. The UN resolution, and I quote, deplores, it says, in the strongest terms, the aggression by the Russian Federation and calls on it to immediately and unconditionally withdraw. Of course, the resolution is legally non-binding. Russia doesn't actually have to do anything, but it's nonetheless very significant when you consider the countries that have chosen to abstain. Countries like Cuba and Venezuela, who are normally reliable Russian allies. Even the UN UAE, having chosen to abstain in a similar vote last week, today chose to align itself with Ukraine. At one point, the Russian ambassador today, so backed up against the wall was he, chose to tout Donald Trump's uh, big lie that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. Perhaps he heard Joe Biden's assertion last night in his first State of the Union address that Vladimir Putin, he said, was now more isolated from the world than ever before. President Biden fresh from church this morning to mark Ash Wednesday, the cross on his forehead designed to reflect human mortality. Not that they need any reminders of that in Ukraine. Nothing is off the table. The president's response to how far he would go to rein in Russia. No American boots on the ground in Ukraine, that much we know. But a forceful reiteration last night of what would happen if Vladimir Putin dares step foot on NATO soil. The United States and our allies will defend every inch of territory that is NATO territory with the full force of our collective power. Every single inch. It drew rare bipartisan support, as did this not so veiled threat. I say to the Russian oligarchs, no more. We're joining with European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets. We're coming for you, or ill-begotten gains. And tonight, I'm announcing that we will join our allies in closing off American airspace to all Russian flights, further isolating Russia and adding additional squeeze on their economy. A welcome move, but a largely symbolic one. This is a public execution in the middle of Europe in the 21st century. Alexandra Ustinova is a Ukrainian MP who arrived in Washington, D.C. just before the Russian invasion began. She says Biden's new no-fly zone will do nothing to stop the slaughter in her homeland. This is inconvenient, but this is not killing their economy and this is not stopping Putin. But sanctions on Russia's energy sector would help to stop him, she says, if only Biden and the West had the courage to implement them, despite the inevitable higher fuel prices. The United States and the EU protected their energy sectors and they excluded them from the sanctions. And this is where Putin gets his money from oil and gas. Well, then we have to go out and, and say that we are protecting our markets, so we don't want the American citizen paying, I don't know, what, 30, 50 cents extra for the gas, for a gallon, so that Ukrainians keep dying. What do you want Joe Biden to do? We are not asking with the, for the boots on the ground, but we need equipment to protect our sky. We need a no-fly zone. But you know the no-fly zone, they're not going to do that because they think it's too big a risk that it will be seen as NATO, as America, going to war directly with Russia. Well, I'm so sorry, but when is, what is the red line? How many people have to die so that we get help? And so basically one crazy bully is now telling the whole world what they need to be doing because he is a crazy psycho can push the button. Well, if he does want to push a button, he will. Stop Putin! 
American war machine. Outside the White House, the same message from Ukrainian Americans. Take action now! Biden says no boots on the ground for now. But as more harrowing images roll in, the question is how far is the rest of the country prepared to go to stop Putin's war? Siobhan Kennedy in Washington, D.C. Well, earlier I spoke to General David Petraeus, who, after an army career, including the command of the combined ISAF force in Afghanistan, served as the director of the CIA under President Obama. I started by asking him whether NATO should get involved in this conflict. I'm not sure that every NATO country or the Eastern European NATO countries would be eager uh, to have forces flying out of their countries, uh, given that that could lead to some kind of uh, action from a man who mm. is increasingly right. cornered in Moscow uh, and is increasingly willing to sanction uh, really destructive attacks uh, that are going way beyond those on military forces in Ukraine, but are hitting civilian infrastructure. And I think that NATO rightly is being very careful, even as it does, continue to provide very substantial amounts of military assistance and here Germany providing lethal uh, assistance for the first time uh, after having been criticized for providing Kevlar helmets uh, earlier in this mm. particular endeavor. But the emotional pressure on Western governments, on NATO, to do something <clears throat> will surely increase as we get more and more images every day of civilian centers being pummeled by the Russian artillery and also being able to see the potential targets of any airstrikes, you know, from commercial satellites. Uh, all of that is very understandable, but I should tell you that whenever I heard someone say in the situation room, the real situation room in the White House, um, the hair on the back of my neck would go up when someone said, we must do something. Um, what you have to do is mm. figure out precisely what it is that we can and should do. And I would just point out that what has been done is unprecedented. The economic, uh, diplomatic, and other sanctions uh, taken against Russia, its financial system, its banks, uh, its oligarchs, and others are really quite extraordinary. Uh, but again, I do not think that it is wise to put uh, American or British or other NATO forces in on the ground in Ukraine to where they can end up clashing directly with Russian forces uh, or uh, in the air where there could be an inadvertent incident as well. I just think that that would be very unwise. Before you do that, let's go around and padlock every townhouse owned by an oligarch in Kensington and Mayfair and do it publicly with TV cameras rolling. Let's take away every soccer team. Can we be brutally honest here, General Petraeus? Are you worried about NATO getting sucked into this? Because at the end of the day, that could lead to nuclear war between NATO and Russia. Uh, that's part of it, but also might lie World War III, even without nuclear weapons, would be horrific. We've pushed additional U.S. forces into each of the three Baltic states, uh, eastern Poland, and other of the now uh, potentially frontline countries, although I don't think that Russia will be able to conquer Ukraine. I think the people remain undaunted. Zelensky continues to provide Churchillian leadership, and the forces are performing very impressively, of course, defending their homeland. Uh, but again, yes, there is a concern. There should be a concern. So there's a very bright red line, which is that which goes along the borders of NATO countries. Cross that, and Article 5 will be invoked. An attack on one is an attack on all. That's the cornerstone of the NATO alliance. But beyond that, I think we should be careful. And I think President Biden is being uh, properly uh, careful in that regard. You know a lot about counterinsurgency from your experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. Is that what the Russians are facing here if they manage to occupy this country? A protracted war of attrition, a guerrilla war in the cities of Kyiv and Kharkiv and possibly even here, uh, Lviv. Well, they're already seeing some of that. Um, I would, I think, predict that they will not be able to hold large cities, even if they can take a city, even if they literally destroy much of it, depopulate the rest and can occupy it, they're going to find it very, very hard to do. Urban combat in particular is very soldier intensive and the 190,000 troops the Russians have mustered are nowhere near enough uh, to do that. Obviously, we criticize him here in the West for conducting a war of choice 
based on a lie. Now, people in Moscow are saying to us, well, that's exactly what you did in Iraq. You don't have the moral high ground to criticize us over what we're doing in Ukraine. What's your response to that? Uh, my response to that is that it's absolutely wrong. Uh, I was the exec to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a colonel. I was obviously then a one and a two star before we did the invasion of Iraq, had access to the intelligence. We truly did believe that Saddam Hussein had uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, again, that was a role that was flawed. That was a huge uh, intelligence failure. Uh, but we didn't invade uh, in the way that Vladimir Putin uh, is invading. Uh, and so, again, I just reject that wholeheartedly. General Petraeus, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.